Well, it's good to be in God's house once again. Praise the Lord. I want to welcome those who are watching by Facebook. God bless you, especially India. Keep India in prayer, by the way, because they're going to go through some rough times. I can't mention now that we're on Facebook. I can't mention those rough times, but they're heading in some directions by the government, and so we want to just um, keep them in prayer. Amen? Praise the Lord. I want to share with you this morning the key of David. The key of David. And before I give you the scripture references on this, I just want to talk about for a moment what a key represents. How many here have keys? How many of us have too many keys? I do. I have too many keys on my ring. I have to go through about five different keys sometimes just to get through. Some say, well, why don't you get different color keys? Well, I think, I don't know, I don't like that. But, but keys represent something. If you have a key to something, it means that you have the ability and the authority to unlock and to lock something. Amen? So the key of David, when we get to the scriptures, is going to talk about authority. And we're, we're studying that on Wednesday nights about authority and being under authority, being under uh, God's authority and authority for the family, authority for the government authority for the church. Um, there's no, <clears throat> let me put it in a very easy way. There is no doing what's right in your own eyes philosophy. That's what Israel had in the church when everyone did what was right in their own eyes when there was no king. There was no leader. There was no one that would uh, take up the key, if you will, of David at that time and use the authority that God has instilled upon them. In the American churches today, you find that ministers and leaders are very disrespected. Very disrespected. You go, to, you go anywhere like Nigeria or you go into the Middle East or you go into uh, Asia, and you'll find there is a tremendous respect for men of God that serve God. In fact, they are biblical. America is not biblical. America is not biblical at all. We chastise. We speak against our leaders. We talk about them. And God is not pleased with that. The key of David, as you're going to see, it's not something just in the New Testament, but founded in the Old Testament. And it speaks of authority. And I know each and every one of you here this morning, though independent you are, and as independent as you can be, you're still under authority. And if you don't think so, go through the next red light you come to. Go through the first stop sign you go through. Reject the first order of a state policeman who goes like this and pulls you over. Reject that authority and see how far you'll get. You're under authority every single day of your life. In different ways, when you go to work, you're under the authority of the place you work at. And you've got to follow certain rules and authority that's there. And if you don't follow their rules, guess what happens? You get fired. So there are rules even in school. You don't do your work. You don't listen. You don't pay attention. Guess what? You're going to fail. And when you fail, you don't get your diploma. You've got to submit to the authority of the teachers and learn. The key of David was some authority that was given in the Bible, not by man, not appointed by a board, not appointed by a denomination. It was appointed by Almighty God. And this key of David holds a tremendous responsibility and accountability. Only those who God can trust can hold this key. And I would say that when we look at it in the Old Testament, you'll see that there were kings that was given this key, but I want to talk about the one that's in the book of Revelation. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, I want you to turn to Revelation chapter 3. We're going to start with verse 7. 
Revelation chapter 3 and verse 7. Heavenly Father, I just pray that God, this lesson today would be applicable to those who are hearing and would receive your word today. For in it, as we apply it and we obey it, there is great blessing. So, Father, thank you and we praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, Right. These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man can shut, and shutteth and no man can open. Say no man. I want you to understand that this is talking about Jesus, who is holy and true. He is the one. We don't have the key because God can't trust us with the key of authority. If we had authority, like Vicki said, and she had the power of life and death in her tongue, her dad would be dead. At the moment, she wanted him to be dead. If she had that kind of authority, if we had that kind of authority, people would be dead. We, people that cut us off, oh, well, yeah, <laughs> that old flesh would rise up and we would, we, would, we would abuse authority. Huh? Those morning people, yes. I sent her a text and I gave her a little cartoon about two kinds of people. There's a morning person. And there's a person that wakes up in a frenzy that wants to kill morning people. But this key of David is so important to understand and to respect authority. Now, I know as a constable, there are many people when I sit in the courtrooms and I listen to some of these people and their cases and how they come into court dressed the way they do. Now, I don't know, but some of them have all these knots in their head. I don't know what that kind of hairstyle is, but I mean, they got these long knots. They look like cigars. What do they call them? Dreads? Well, they are dreading, all right, yeah. And, I, and I'll tell you, they come into court with these dreads. They come down with their pants down to here. Their shorts are showing. Come in muscle shirts. And they're standing before a person of authority <laughs> because they did something wrong. That just speaks volumes to the court of disrespect. I remember one time hearing the judge say, uh, um, before we hear your case, you go back home and you change up and then you come back. Because people don't respect authority. And they don't realize, because in America, you know what, so what? It doesn't make any difference. Yes, it does. Tell that to the child that the parents warned and says, listen, I don't want you to drink and drive. We just got you that car. We just bought you the insurance. And as your parent, I'm asking you not to drink and drive. And then that child goes out and drinks, gets into an accident, and kills someone. Because that child didn't listen to authority. Now there's a whole can of worms that's open for another family, a tragedy, a life lost, this person being charged with vehicle homicide. All because they didn't respect authority. When you respect authority, 
you say, yes, okay. I understand. When that police officer on the, on the highway steps out into the, the lane, when we saw this one time, my wife and I, we couldn't believe it. A state trooper came right in the, there's three lanes, right in the first lane, right out in the first lane, went, not to us, you over. And that car, whoop. He can do that because he has the entire state of Massachusetts or whatever state it is enforcing the law behind him. He has been given the authority with that badge that's on his chest. Now, I know there might be some circling thoughts in your mind. Oh, but there's those that abuse it. I'm not talking about abuse authority. I'm talking about authority itself. And here in this scripture, it says, He that is holy, he that is true, he has the key of David. What is the key of David? It is the authority of him being who he said he was and a legal right to be in that place of authority. If you look in the book of Matthew, chapter 1, some people, they can't get through the begats. This one begat that, that one begat that, this one begat that, this one begat that, and then begat. And you go through all the genealogy there. But in verse 17, now let's go to verse 16. It says, And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. How many know that Christ is not his last name? <laughs> it's not. Christ means anointed one, the Messiah. And verse 17 says, so all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David to the carrying away of Babylon are 14 generations. And from the carrying of Babylon into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. So we see through the genealogy, and many times in Scripture, David, um, Jesus was called the son of David. And because he came through the lineage of David, and because he was the son of God, he has the authority to sit in Israel as the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. He is, not will be, he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. In fact, I preached a message on this about a year or two ago uh, in Isaiah chapter 6. It says, when King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, and he was high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. If you know anything about King Uzziah, King Uzziah was one who fell away from the truth of God. And what ended up happening to him was he was ousted from the kingdom with leprosy. And he died of his leprosy, and he was buried at the foot of the Mount of Olives. In fact, there was an archaeological discovery of the plate, his death. You know how they have plates on the, on the tombs? They found the, the plate of his tomb right at the foot of Mount Olives. What does the Bible say? When Jesus comes, he's coming to the Mount of Olives. And, he, and the voice that he's going to speak out, the dead will be raised. The first ones that will be raised are the ones that are at the, the foot of the Mount of Olives. They're all the kings of Israel. He is the king of kings. Come on, they're going to bow their knee to the king of kings. He has that authority. He's been given that authority. And what does he do with that authority? Let's look at Re Revelation chapter 3 again. Let me get there real quick. Verse 7 says, To the angel of the church of Philadelphia write these things, saith the holy, he that has, it's true, he that has the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shuts it. And I remember one time Linda and I were driving uh, to Providence. 
this was years ago in your Toyota Corolla. Uh, not your Corolla, your um, Celica. And before they fixed the roads, there was a real, real S turn there as you go over the Washington Bridge there. And we turned the corner to go, and there was a car sideways. And we heard brakes squealing, and we went to the left and went around, and but without warning, that car was trying to get out. They went up the wrong ramp and trying to get out. And I had been thinking, and I'd been praying. I said, Lord, I think this was a time when we were either with a ministry or we were just starting the church. I don't remember. And God spoke this scripture to me. And he said, the door that I open, no man can shut. I think it was during my time of ordination I was seeking also. And the door that I shut, no man can open. Because God has the authority, Jesus has the authority to open and no man can shut it. No matter what you go through in life, hallelujah, or no matter what he tells you, no matter what God calls you to. I'm wondering why it's 75 in here, and I got the heat on here. Let me just check real for a moment. That shouldn't be on there like that. Okay, that's see. I set that before, and it changed. I don't know why it changes, why it does that. And sometimes you'll see me on my phone. I'm not texting anybody outside the church. I'm texting Bobby back there so we can have messages. Just so you know, you see me looking at my phone. I'm not texting anybody outside the church. I'm texting Bobby instead of running back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And so when I saw that car and God spoke that to me, I knew. I said, God, that is true. Whatever door you open for me, no man can close it. And the door that you close, no man can open it. Now, I remember hearing a testimony of two evangelists. And they were saying how they wanted to start a ministry in a certain city. And they went there and they tried um, beginning the ministry, trying to rent a place. They couldn't rent a place. Trying to, trying to get a place that they could meet, they couldn't get a place to meet. So they said, what we need to do is we need to fast and we need to pray. And so they fasted and they prayed and they tried again. Nothing happened. And they said, the, the, this is crazy. It feels like there's a wall up here and we can't get through the wall. Keep fasting, keep praying. So the people got together and they kept fasting and praying. And finally, one day at the altar, one of the leaders was there and said, God, I'm, I'm getting frustrated. I don't understand. Why is it like we're up against the wall? And the Holy Spirit began a message in tongues. That's why I love the gifts of the Spirit. And an interpretation came, and this was the interpretation. I am the God who has put up the wall. It wasn't God's will for them to establish a work in that city. Hello? So no matter how much they try to spin their wheels and do their thing, it's not going to happen if you're truly seeking after the will of God. Now, don't get me wrong. There are works that open their own doors and they serve their own consequences. Okay. I remember our son Sam from Africa told me a story. He said, Daddy, he says, I attend this church in New Jersey. He said, they started out with, I think, 10, 12 people, whatever it was. They grew to over 5,000 in five years. They had a school. They had a, they had a, 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 a high school. They had a grammar school. They had everything. And because the leadership, the, the pastor wasn't, Founded enough and grounded enough, he fell into sin. 
The whole church fell apart. There's no more church in that city like that. The door that God opens, no man can shut. If that was an open door from God, God would have appointed another person to come take over that work. Hello? Jesus has the authority, the key of David, to rule as king of kings and lord of lords. Now, he says, I got the key and... And verse 8 says, I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door. You've got an open door. I've opened that door. This is where people don't realize that. See, we want God to open the doors we want God to open. How many ever watched Let's Make a Deal? Ever see Let's Make a Deal? Nobody seen Let's Make a Deal? I see people with their hands all crossed. Nobody ever seen that? Yeah, you've seen it? Okay. Let's make a deal. We do that with God. Let's make a deal. All right, what door you want? Door number one, door number two, or door number three? I want the one where it has the, the grand prize. Well, we can't do that. You've got to take whatever door you want. Come on, somebody. See, we want to tell God which doors to open. Hello? Well, let me ask you a question. You have the key? Who's got the key? God's got the key. And if he doesn't want to unlock that door, then I don't want that door. I remember a quick story. I'll give you this little quick story. There was uh, it, it, these uh, three guys, and they were going to die, and they were being sentenced. And he says, okay, your punishment is this. And they open the door, and in it was a bunch of cow manure this high. He said to one guy, what do you want to do? He says, well, he says, he says I guess I'll kneel, I'll kneel down if I can up to my neck. He says, okay, go ahead. Go. And the other guy, he says, well, I want to just stand there like this. He said, well, that's okay. And the other guy said, can I go to my neck too? He says, yeah, that's okay. Go ahead. So they get in there. And a whistle blows and the voice says, okay, all those that are standing, coffee breaks over, down on your heads. You can't choose what door God will open for you. Hello? Hello? You can try to force it, and you will force it, but you will reap the consequences of that choice. Why? Because you're going against the authority that God has placed. Now, the world we, in which we live in today, I want you to go to the office max or staples or somewhere, and I want you to get some white out. Okay? And I want you to start whiting out scriptures that you... Don't like. For instance, God is the head of Christ. Christ is the head of man. Man is the head of woman. Uh-oh. Now, here's the difference. Women, you don't have to listen to your husbands. You respect them. But if they're taking you away from God or taking you from where God has intended for you, you don't have to listen. They're abusing their authority. They're abusing their authority. If my wife backslides and goes out dancing and carousing and wants me to go with her, I'm not going with her. I love my wife, but I love Jesus more. I love my eternal, my eternal life more than I love my wife. I love my God more than I, I love my wife. In fact, just the other day, I dropped her off to go see her, her eye at the nursing home. I said, how about a kiss, honey? She just went right like this and walked right, walked right into the thing. Didn't, 
Didn't even acknowledge, not, didn't even say nothing. Didn't. I said, my God. <laughs> Joe was there and he's cracking up. I said, man, I can't believe she did that. I said, how, how about a kiss, honey? Help. Just walk right in. Didn't have time of day for me. But God says, I've opened the door for you. He's opened the door for all of us toward his blessings, toward his promises. Come on, somebody. All of the things that God has pertained to life and godliness, he's already given us. He's given us the authority to use them. He's given us authority over scorpions and serpents, over all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall by any means hurt us because he's opened that door by having the authority in heaven and on earth. He said that. All power has been given unto me. In heaven. Think about it. And on earth. So if God wants something... If God has a plan and he has something, man can't stop it. They can hinder it, but ultimately they can't stop it. That's why I like I.W. Shambach. He went into a town, had a, had a camp meeting, had the tents set up. I wish they would do those days again. The old camp meetings. Old tent meetings when he was in Brockton, we used to go there, and I. W. Shambach was there. Well, he's dead now, but but uh, we used to go to those meetings. Power of God would fall; people get healed, delivered. And he went to this one town, and he saw a building, and the Lord spoke to him and said, "That's that's my building. I want you to put a church there." So he had a for sale sign on the building. So he called the realtor up and he said, listen, my name is W.I.W. Shambach and I want you to know that God has spoken to me that this building on such and such a street is mine. You can't sell it. He says, in fact, I, I have the sign in the back of my seat in my car. The real estate guy said, you have what? He says, I took the sign down. He said, that, that building is mine. God spoke to me and said he's going to give it to me. He said, you bring that sign right back to my office right now. I'll have you arrested for stealing that sign. He says, I'll bring it by for you. So he brought it by. And a few days later, he went back there, and there was the sign again. He took the sign down again, put it in his car, and called the realtor and said, look, I told you already. God told me that this building is mine. He says, well, do you want to purchase it? He said, no. God said he's going to give it to me. That night, in the meeting of the tent meeting, there was a woman. She had cancer. She came forward and I.W. Shambach prayed for her and God miraculously healed her of that cancer. How many believe God can still heal a cancer? Healed her totally of cancer. After the service was over the next day, he went back and there was the sign again on the building. He went right up to that sign, yanked that thing right off the building, put it in his car, called the real estate and said, listen, I told you, God told me that that was my building that he's going to give it to me. He said, I want a meeting with the owner. So he went into the office, and the real estate guy called the owner on the, on the uh, phone and said, listen, he says, I got a preacher here that's interested in your building, but he said that God told him that you were going to give it to him. And so the man said, What's the man's name? And he said, what is your name? He said, my name's R.W. Shambach. He said, R.W. Shambach. And when he said that, the wife said, who? She said, R.W. Shambach. She said, that's the man I was telling you about. I was there the other night, and that's the man that prayed for me, and I got healed of my cancer. And the husband said, the building is yours. You can have it for nothing. Come on, somebody. The door that God opens, 
Hallelujah. No man can shut it. Praise God. He says, I've set before you an open door. Why does God want us to walk through open doors? Because he wants to take you from where you are to where you need to be. But he's not going to push you through those doors. You've got to be willing to walk through those doors. And you've got to be able to walk away from the doors that he's closing. Hello. Why? Because the doors that he's closing means that his grace has ended in that place. He closes the door because the blessings have come to an end in that place. He's got a new place for you. Hallelujah. And he says, the doors that I close, no man can open. If you really want God's will, if you really want God's will, you'll walk away from those closed doors. You won't try to force those doors open on your own. Because that's only curses that's allowed in those places. Come on, somebody. Understand, when you're obedient to this word, you will be blessed. Now, I'm not a prosperity preacher like the ones on TV, promising you everything. Give me a thousand, give me a, give me a, a thousand dollars, God will bless you with a hundredfold blessing. If that's true, then why don't they give me the thousand and they'll get the hundredfold blessing? Oh, it don't work that way. I set before you an open door. And the door that I open, no man can shut. And the door I shut, no man can open. Look at for a moment with me, please. Isaiah 22, 22. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulders. Hmm. So he shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open. That's where the scripture originally originated from was Isaiah. The reference is to a faithful servant named Eliakim under the rule of King Hezekiah. It seems that the man that preceded him, Shebna, was unfaithful, and these scriptures were the Lord's promise to give his position to Eliakim. He promised him all the authority and privileges of the house of David. That key of David is a promise All the authority and privileges of the house of David. And one of these privileges was sole possession of the keys to the treasury. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ already holds the, the keys of hell and death. Let me talk about that for a moment. <clears throat> Jesus said, I have the keys of hell and death. It's in the Bible. There's a teaching out there that says when Jesus died on the cross, he went into hell and he kicked those gates of hell open. You heard the preachers. And he went in there and he took the keys away from Satan, the keys of death. That's a lie. Satan was never given that authority. He doesn't have the keys. Jesus has the keys. Hello. Jesus has the key of death and hell, not the devil. He never had it. God never gave it to him. Think about it. He didn't have it when he was in heaven representing all the musicians in heaven. And singing glory unto God. He never had that authority of the keys of hell and death. What makes you think God gave it to him after he fell? That's why you and I as Christians don't have to fear death. 
We don't have to fear death. Because Jesus holds the key of death. When I go on the mission field, people say, gee, you, you went there? Aren't you scared? Aren't you scared to go? My wife and I, we went into a, a Muslim community. All Muslims. We were the only Christians I know of. We're sitting in the car. My wife's like, I want to get out of here. But when you're where you need to be, you don't have to fear. Your flesh might get a little nervous. I'm not saying we walked in there like, hey, you know. No. I mean, we might have walked in there like this, but we're still walking. Hello? Okay. We didn't let this stop us. We went like this. We're coming. Okay, Lord, you're with us, right? Okay. <laughs> Here we go. Why? Because he opened the door. If he opens the door, you have the authority. Remember the ones that tried to cast out the devils, sons of Sceva? I said, let's see if this thing works. Let's see if the, let's see if the scripture works. And they said to a person that was demon-possessed, I adjure you by the Jesus that Paul preacheth. Come out of him. What happened? The demon spoke and said, Jesus I know. Paul I know. But who are you? What was he saying there? Jesus has the authority. Paul has the authority. But you don't have the authority. Hello? Why? Because they were going by what a person says in a formula. Huh? They were using a formula. You can't use a formula to cast out devils. You've got to have the authority. God's given authority over. Come on, somebody. God has given me, the, he's given me a gift of authority over demons. I don't get scared. Over witches, I don't get scared. I went into a coffee shop one time, sat down, it was a, a woman trying to read someone's cards. You know the card readers there, you know, fortune tellers? I looked over, I said, oh my God. Can't even go and have a donut and a coffee without... Someone conjuring up these demon spirits. And I said this. I bind that spirit in the name of Jesus. You can't work where I'm at. All of a sudden, ladies, there, she pays her money, whatever. She's slamming those cards down. <clears throat> they said, what's wrong? She said, I, I, I can't read you here. Come on, we got to go. Hello. Another time, Linda and I are driving down the road, and we look over, and we see a, a, a store. Remember that? It was an occult bookstore here in New Bedford. The Holy Spirit quickened me and said, go pr lay hands on that store and close it. So I said, Linda, let's, let's pull the car over. Linda and I went and laid hands on that building. We bind your spirit in the name of Jesus from working in this area. You must leave this area now. God has spoken that we do this, and because he spoke it, we have the authorities and the door that he opened. Come on, somebody. Within two weeks, that place was gone. And it happened another time with a palm reader. I was just walking by the place, and I said, I, you, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. You close in Jesus' name. A month or two later, went back that way. Look, there's no palm reader there no more. We need to go through the doors that God opens and not be afraid. Come on. Hallelujah. Make sure it's God. God's given us authority. When we had the other building over there, someone told me four witches went to the door over there, that other place we were at. 
and prayed a curse over us. And when they told me, I said, it doesn't affect me. And they looked at me, huh? I said, that don't affect me. I'm covered in the blood. I'm in a blood covenant with Jesus. He's got to get through the blood. He can't get through the blood. Hello? You all know the story about the witch that put a curse on me while I was preaching? Thought I was going to die with a heart attack. I had to stop and have everybody pray. I said, Lord, if he's not going to repent, and God, if you know in your foreknowledge he's not going to ever come to you, I pray what he throws on me goes back to him. Two weeks later on a Sunday morning, he died of a heart attack, 41 years old. The high Satanist priest witch in, in Salem, Massachusetts. You can't fool God. Hello? The door he opens, no man can close. We've had demonic women come into this church. Remember that one over on Rockdale Avenue? I had to pray for it. I said, what are you doing here? He said, I'm on assignment. I said, well, hey, assignment's canceled. Never came back. Hello. You don't have to be afraid of these things. Oh, if you get serious with Jesus, it's going to kill your family. Don't believe that lie. Well, they're all going down the wrong path. Well, guess what? They'll find the right path. The door he opens, no man can shut. Take authority. Don't be wishy-washy. Don't be compromised. Devil loves compromise. You lo if you compromise, guess what? Devil loves you. Because when you compromise, that gives them a way of escape. Hello? When God opens the door, he shuts the door. You need to shut the door to your past life. I got up today, and I was, I was, I was somewhere. Where was I? It was right here in church. The devil came with me with a temptation. I said, you stinking devil, get out of here. I, I began to thank God. I said, God, thank you. That Bob Langevin's dead. Hallelujah. He was crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live not yet I, but Christ lives in me. In the life and I don't live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's scripture. you got to get scripture in you. Fight the devil with scripture. Not, don't fight him with your willpower. He'll knock you out. If you are in Christ Jesus, the Bible says old things have passed away. In other words, they're all dead. All things are becoming new. Hallelujah. Don't revert back to that. Don't open the doors that God has closed. Come on, somebody. Don't open those doors that God has closed. God closed some doors. Hallelujah. Praise God. I remember one time, Mama and I, as godly as we are, we got in a fight. Yeah, we got in a fight. Not a fist fight. And that's before I knew that you could choke him, you know, like Brother Diamond said. <laughs> no, you can't choke him either. And uh, she opened up her file cabinet on me, started going through and picking out all those things. Remember when you did this? Remember when you did that? You did this, you did that, you did this. And I sat there and I said, I didn't own a gun at the time. <laughs> I'm only kidding. Facebook, I'm only kidding, okay? Don't jump all over me. Oh, man, Pastor, I was going to shoot his wife. <laughs> and I thought about it. And she kept going on a little bit. And I said to her, I said, Linda, how would you like it if God kept his cabinet on you open? Every time you did something wrong, he went in it and plucked it out. Hello? It was as quiet as it was in this room, just him and me. She closed that file cabinet and never opened it up again. She never throws my past in my face, ever. Thank God. She just ignores me. Can I have a kiss, honey?
Amen? We're human. We're going to get into some battles. But the one thing my wife and I always do, we love and forgive one another. There's nothing in this world that's worth us being split apart. Amen. The only thing is if she pushed me off a cliff or something like that, but that's, she wouldn't do that anymore. I don't think you wouldn't do that, would you, Linda? Look, no answers here. Yeah. Uh, I got to watch out for cliffs now. Okay. But praise God. The door that he opens, no man can shut. God is opening up an opportunity for you and I every single day to be the person that he has created us to be because he has the authority in our lives, in our children's lives. Yeah, but you don't know my children. You don't know how they're acting. They're wild. Yeah. Maybe because God is allowing that to show you who you were. Hello? I mean, even when you're small, even when you're small. I saw Amari one time telling somebody off. Baby talk. Wow, I don't want to get on her bad side. <laughs> God has put before you an open door, an opportunity. How many ever heard opportunity knocks once? Sometimes it does, only once. That's why you never burn bridges. Because God might have you walk over that bridge again. Well, I'm not going to have anything to do with that no more. Don't burn your bridge. Sometime you might have to cross that bridge over to apologize. Trust me, I know from experience. The door he opens, because he's of the house of David, because he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords, because he has the key of authority and power. Well, let's bring it home as I close. Is he the Lord of your life? I didn't ask you if he was Savior. Many people want Jesus as Savior. But is he Lord? What does it mean to have him as Lord? It means to have him in rulership in your life, in your marriage. To have him in the workplace. To have him when no one's watching. To have him outside the church. As your Lord. Is he your Lord? And not just saying he's Lord because that doesn't really cut it either. You can sing it. He is Lord. Oh, he is Lord. You can sing it all you want to. But if he's not Lord. Jesus said, there were those that said to him, Lord, Lord, and he said, depart from me, I never knew you. Why? Because he never had that intimate relationship with Christ. Christ gave, him the, gave you the opportunity to have that closeness with him. And what happens? Sometimes we do just like Linda. We just walk away. But is he Lord? Is he in your life? Is he the king ruling over the authority? Remember Jesus said, you know, the disciples were looking for the kingdom of God. You know, they wanted to come back and kill all the Romans, you know, get rid of the Roman occupancy and take Jerusalem back and become a nation. And you know, they wanted all of that. And they wanted the kingdom of God to come because they knew the kingdom of God principle was that you can't have a kingdom without having a king. And they wanted to appoint Jesus at that time king, and he said no. Why? Because Jesus said the kingdom of God is within you. Those who receive him, the kingdom of God now resides in them. 
And if the kingdom of God resides in there, you've got to have a king. Don't be like Israel. When there was no king in Israel, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Don't be like that. If Christ is in you, then the kingdom is in you, then he is ruling you as king of kings. And if he's ruling you, you've got to obey what he says. Hello? Can you hear those crickets? I can hear them. I'm going to ask Bob to play a little something. As we close. You've got to have the key in order to have the authority. Sometimes I tell Jesus, I don't want the key. Because with a key comes responsibility. Even in relationships. If someone has the key to your heart, it's a tremendous responsibility for that. Let me ask you this morning. The kingdom of God lives within us. Let him be king. Let him direct you. Let him instruct you. Let him lead you. Is there someone here? Every eye closed, please. Bow, bow your heads for a moment. You say to me, Pastor, I, I'm not sure I know Jesus. I don't have Jesus. I know about Jesus, but I don't know if I have him as my Lord and my king but I want him today I want to make that public declaration today Jesus said if you're ashamed of me before men I'll be ashamed of you before my father in heaven but you want to say Lord today I want you to be king in my life I want you to have the authority and the keys to my life I'm going to hand them over to you today if that's you, I want you to slip your hand up right now. So I want to give you the keys today. I want to turn over the authority to you. Amen. Those that raise your hand, stand please for a moment. Go ahead, just stand. Don't worry about what people are going to say, say or think. Lord, I want you to have the keys to my heart, to my life. Lord, I want to do things your way, not my way. And I want to speak the things that you speak, not the things that I want to speak. I want me to be able to bring healing and peace and joy into every aspect of my life. And God, I know that door you will open. Close the doors in my life that don't belong open. And Father, if there be any hurts in my heart, in my life, any unforgiveness, I ask you to remove it now in Jesus' name. Cleanse me, Lord. Let this be a new beginning for me to be able to walk in your ways. I hand you the keys, the ownership, the authority. And I thank you for the many doors that you are going to begin to open in my life and the many doors you're going to close. And I thank you and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me pray for you. God, we thank you and praise you, Lord. We ask that you bless your people. Be with them, Father. And God, thank you for the Holy Ghost. Thank you for the Spirit of God that has come to be our comforter, our strength, and present help in time of trouble. Thank you, Lord. Lead us and guide us as we go our separate way and keep us safe. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. God bless you this morning.